Okay, so I think I will start. So uh, welcome everybody to our talk uh, on interdisciplinary advancement of trust in autonomous vehicles. Um, just to say this event is being recorded and live streamed. Um, if you've got an issue with Zoom, uh, then you can uh, visit the CPC website, go to our events page and you can watch the live stream. Um, but it's good to be on Zoom uh, because you can use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, so please feel free to post questions there uh, throughout the event, um, which we will then uh, feed in to the Q&A session. So just going through the agenda. Um, so um, we have uh, speakers and presentations uh, for 45 minutes and then uh, 15 minutes of questions and we're aiming to finish uh, by 12 o'clock uh, ready for, for lunchtime. Um, so uh, people speaking today is uh, myself. I am Thomas Webster. I'm a principal technologist here at Connected Places Catapult. Um, we're then followed by uh, Dr. Peter Popoff, uh, who's a professor at the uh, at City University, and uh, Xinyu Wu, uh, who's a PhD candidate uh, of so social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I've just got one slide here, um, just trying to frame uh, what is autonomous vehicle safety and trust. Um, so um, a lot of the work goes into um, a so-called, uh, what we call kind of a technical framework for AV safety. Um, so we have various areas of safety that need to be covered, and then um, the various processes uh, that need to be done in order to get assurance of all those areas of safety. And uh, these are all, uh, a lot of hard work needs to go into covering these areas. Firstly, because it is um, involving a lot of very complex problems and systems. Um, but um, secondly, um, because this is uh, not being done in isolation, that it's associated with an AV ecosystem. It needs to fit in uh, with all sorts of uh, different factors involved, uh, different organizations and entities involved uh, in the deployment of AVs in the real world. So um, if you just click through all of these, so you've got service providers, transport operators, TI technical inspection and certification bodies, standards bodies, road users, end users, uh, road authorities, insurers, uh, developers, uh, regulators, uh, I may have even missed a few here, but all sorts of people, uh, all, every, lots of different people involved uh, in the actual deployment of AVs. So this ACU system, um, it's contributing knowledge uh, directly into uh, the technical framework, that arrow there, um, but also coming out of that, um, you've, you, by, by engaging with the ecosystem, uh, you're finding what are the actual requirements and needs you need to satisfy um, in, in order for, to, to satisfy the, the needs of, this, of the system. Um, the technical framework, that that's providing solutions, things like techniques and products, um, but it's not all done in one hit. So you, you, you get your initial idea of your requirements and needs, um, things like what what does what are the demands of society? What what do they actually require to have trust, for example? Um, but it's not done in a single hit um, because it's so complicated. People come back and then just the last click. Uh, there's another sorry sorry can uh, yeah um, the the solution is not perfect um, and so uh, you have this feedback cycle of well, I can't answer that question. I, I can maybe answer it in a different way. Um, is that good enough? And so it's kind of this kind of loop where um, all these kind of questions I see being uh, thrashed out in terms of what, you, what, how safe is safe enough and so on and so forth. 
So that, that's me just trying to frame uh, in a single slide uh, this very complicated problem. Um, so yes, uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to say that uh, CPC, uh, Connected Places Catapult, is uh, doing a variety of projects in this area. Um, so uh, Vericab is one active project uh, where uh, we're looking at uh, helping to develop uh, the verification tooling as part of that technical framework um, and various other projects that we've been involved with. Um, there's also the project I'm involved in uh, is called Certicab, which is looking at uh, how, how do you go about giving a, kind of a license uh, for, to, to an AB. So that's uh, my brief introduction. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Peter Popov. Um, who is a reader in systems dependability and associate dean in the School of Mathematics, Computer Science and Engineering at um, City University of London. His research interests are in the area of computer fault tolerance, probabilistic modeling of software fault tolerance, dependability assessment, including Bayesian methods of software systems built with off the shelf software and the use of design diversity as a defense against the design faults. More recently, his interest expanded into probabilistic modeling of inde independent, independency in critical infrastructures and between safety and security of cyber resilience. He has been a principal investigator of projects in these areas funded by the UK, funded in the UK by the National Cybersecurity Centre, Innovate UK, and in, the e and in the EU, including the ongoing AQS project on modeling safety, security, and performance. Peter has published extensively uh, with more than 50 peer reviewed papers and consulted widely on dependability of complex software based systems in several European countries and in the US. So it's my pleasure to uh, hand over to Peter now um, to, uh, to present. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, can you hear my screen? Can you see my screen? Hello, can you hear my screen? Can you see my screen? we can. Okay, uh, so this is uh, the topic uh, from me for today. Uh, AV or CAVs, uh, I see them as uh, a special kind of cyber physical systems and uh, on the right uh, you see how with the colleagues at the City University uh, we look at the uh, assurance of uh, cyber physical system, uh, typically, and this is quite popular in the UK, as uh, we all know. Uh, assurance is uh, uh, demonstrated by building an assurance case, uh, which includes uh, top claim, the system is good enough. Uh, for instance, for uh, AV, this may be that the AV is uh, uh, safe enough. Uh, which has to be uh, demonstrated by a logically correct uh, argument uh, in different domains. Uh, it may require some uh, acceptance of this uh, argument by a regulator. But the argument itself depends on uh, uh, evidence. And uh, the evidence ideally should be uh, solid empirical uh, evidence. And this uh, in uh, some cases may be problematic. Uh, especially when we're dealing with uh, rare events. Uh, uh, cybersecurity is uh, notorious for not really knowing much uh, about the intensity of these attacks, what they're going to do. And in many cases, uh, we have to uh, assure against uh, attacks which are simply unknown and they're ex anticipated to emerge in the future. And for this, uh, recently we put uh, this idea that maybe uh, we can use uh, probabilistic models to generate a proxy 
for evidence. If the evidence is very hard or it's uh, uh, very weak, maybe we can use uh, simulators in order to, to generate uh, additional uh, quasi uh, evidence, which can be fed into the assurance case. And of course, a critical uh, element of uh, doing so is to trust the models. Uh, this have to be high fidelity, sufficiently high fidelity models in order for us to to, uh, to count on the evidence coming from these uh, models. Uh, and how we do it, it's uh, uh, almost an art. You have to try and uh, make mistakes and so on, but uh, this is really the key, uh, the key element. What we get from models, we know that the models, if by the nature, if they're models, they all are wrong, but some models are uh, useful. And the key is if we have uh, useful models, we get insight, which may require for the uh, scrutiny by experts uh, in order to pass uh, expert judgment or uh, to conduct additional uh, measurements uh, with artifacts in order to get uh, solid uh, empirical evidence. So how does it uh, fit with uh, uh, AV? AV, as I said, uh, I see them as a special kind of uh, cyber physical system, therefore, uh, some elements of this assurance framework uh, uh, clearly apply, but there are several problems which make AVs uh, special and they open gaps uh, and uh, the assurance, uh, the way we practice it for decades with other uh, uh, cyber physical systems uh, need to be uh, improved. And the key uh, gaps here are linked to the use of uh, machine learning. This is an active area. Um, I think it's, uh, at least my view, shared by many, is that we don't really know how to assure systems uh, which use uh, uh, machine learning. So this is an area of active research. Uh, we also involved uh, the, the, the team at City. We are co uh, in collaboration with Interlabs in the research institute on uh, safety of uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, this is uh, quite interesting collaboration. The second big gap is uh, related, obviously, to cyber threats, especially uh, when we uh, talk to the connected uh, autonomous vehicle. And the problem is so serious that some of the serious uh, players operating in the uh, cyber security, this is anecdotal evidence, but uh, I, I, I heard it uh, several times, they say safety of autonomous vehicles is a problem so severe so net, not, let, let's not complicate it further by uh, including uh, cybersecurity. But clearly, sooner or later, cybersecurity will have to be dealt uh, uh, with uh, uh, very seriously. Um, this slide uh, is uh, about the so-called uh, ODD, or Operational Design Domain. This, for me, is... Uh, uh, this uh, very uh, problem uh, is quite uh, significant because the argument uh, driving to safety is seen by many as a, a reasonable way out of this uh, predicament. Uh, if we can demonstrate it by driving uh, vehicles safely for millions and millions of miles, maybe we don't need to look at uh, uh, many other things. This is uh, demonstrating by direct uh, evidence. And the ODD uh, poses uh, serious questions. I try to, to be funny here in saying, essentially the problem is uh, if we drive in California or in the uh, uh, UK countryside for millions of miles, does it uh, demonstrate that the same vehicle is uh, safe for use in Siberia where the uh, conditions are very uh, difficult. The whole concept of ODD is not really new. It has been known for in the software uh, testing in particular uh, for a very long time, probably 20 plus years. And people struggled with this uh, concept. If you test the software under uh, testing profile, which is even slightly different from the anticipated uh, operational profile, uh, what are the risks? How much can we infer from the successful test, but uh, on a slightly uh, biased operational profile? And uh, there are two problems with the ODDs. Uh, first, the statement in red, so shown on this uh, slide, uh, says we need to have a comprehensive uh, or uh, exhaustive, uh, rather, is the uh, word used of all ODDs. This is uh, potentially problematic for the reasons that I try to summarize here. 
But even if we assume that the list is uh, okay, the ODDs via which the uh, vehicles is going to, to travel will have to be reliably uh, uh, recognized. And uh, there, is no, if, uh, there is no guarantee that this can be achieved. If we know anything from uh, software reliability for, for the long uh, history of uh, software reliability, this is that with the complexity comes uh, the bugs. And uh, to assume that somehow we can solve this uh, problem once and for all seems a bit uh, too uh, ambitious and therefore unreasonable expectations. Or if the ODDs are not recognized uh, properly, what are the implications? Can safety be uh, affected? And of course, this requires uh, uh, detailed uh, analysis. Um, so the obvious question is, okay, these are kind of uh, well-known uh, problems. Uh, how can probabilistic models uh, help? And the honest answer is that they really can provide the insight. First, and this is the first bullet point, uh, when you build a probabilistic model, you are expected to uh, spell out your assumptions. The assumptions in many cases are captured by uh, various probabilistic parameters. You say, I'm going to run this model under this parameterization, because I believe that these parameters are uh, adequate, if nothing else. And somebody may look at this model and say, I disagree. I don't think that you can justify a, a particular value of the parameter. But this is the beauty of the model. You spell them out. If somebody is uh, not uh, uh, with you, then uh, uh, through discussion, you can uh, refine this model or even play uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, solve the models for a range of uh, values. Um, interdependencies. Uh, so here we have uh, with the uh, autonomous vehicles, especially if we add the uh, uh, cyber attacks, uh, we have uh, this problem of dependencies, uh, how cyber attacks are affecting our, um, uh, how our cyber attacks are affecting uh, the, the behavior, uh, 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 potentially safety, and this has to be spelled out. So. Uh, this is my final slide. Uh, very briefly, uh, the point of this slide is to say how you model and how you capture these uh, interdependencies uh, uh, is really very important. And it is an essential part of uh, building a probabilistic model. On the picture, we have uh, two uh, examples. The, the simplistic part, which is here, shows uh, without attacks. We have a system works okay every now and then it fails. Some of the failures are uh, safe failures, some are uh, unsafe, these are catastrophic. When we move to the untrusted environment, we can assume, and this would be a conservative assumption, that any successful attack uh, should uh, leads immediately to unsafe failure. So we, we increase effectively the intensity of moving from okay state to the unsafe. But the more complicated uh, uh, model is uh, shown here, and it allows us to uh, use uh, things like uh, proactive recovery. Proactive recovery is uh, you have a replicated solution, you, the replicas uh, have to run an agreement protocol, which is tolerant to uh, malicious behavior. And then you periodically you clean uh, this uh, 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 the replicas, uh, assuming that if it has been uh, compromised, it will clean it and therefore the consequences of the attacks are uh, eliminated. This uh, trick is not an academic invention only, it was invented in academia, but it has been de demonstrated in industrial context to be really very, very good. If somebody is interested, I can uh, provide uh, additional information. The point, however, uh, from my, uh, from uh, probabilistic modeling, is that this is more complicated. And depending on how we model the consequences of the attacks uh, using either this model or that model, uh, the the, what we're going to learn from the model of the uh, autonomous vehicles is uh, going to be significantly uh, different. So I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And I'll be delighted if uh, uh, you, you find this uh, presentation of uh, interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, th thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we, we, we do look forward to uh, revisiting and uh, asking some questions um, at the end. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce Sunyi Wu, uh, who is a PhD candidate in social anthropology uh, at the School of Social and Political Science, uh, University of Edinburgh. Um, 
So she has backgrounds in so social anthropology and Chinese ethnic minority economics. She looks at the social integration of autonomous vehicles and her PhD thesis research project is titled, Can Artificial Intelligence Smarten City Transport? And technography of connected autonomous vehicles in the UK. It aims to draw on a holistic view and develop a critical analysis of the socio-political discourse of cabs. Through a technographic investigation of connected autonomous vehicle projects in the UK, her research will bridge the top-down and bottom-up perspectives, revealing how people imagine and live with the possibilities of future transport afforded by cab technology. How plans design and develop cabs in the societal environments and further explore the human and machine relations. So by unpacking the social integration process of CAVs, the project hopes to contribute firstly uh, to policymakers to form a better understanding of the attitudes, behavior and wider public acceptance of tra transport users, um, which will be critical to the success of autonomous vehicles. And secondly, uh, to the technology developers uh, to form a better understanding of individual and societal needs and wants and people's concerns and fears, uh, which will enable improved design of products and service offerings, uh, ultimately helping the autonomous vehicle industry to achieve success. Um, so very interested to hear from you, uh, handing over. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, okay great. Thanks very much to uh, CPC for organizing this webinar and for having me here. So following up on Peter's talk on AV safety modeling, what I want to present here is the social approach to autonomous vehicle research. So my background is in social anthropology. For those who are not very familiar with anthropology, so what we do, anthropologists, we look at everything that's related to human and human society, such as uh, history, culture, language, uh, business, and technology, and their relations with humans. Uh, and we have different disciplines like social anthropology, medical anthropology, anthropology of design, of uh, technology, and business anthropology. So we use various methods like participant observation, interview, and focus group to engage the public to review big issues from small places or small things and dig the meanings behind. So just a bit about my PhD project. Uh, I am investigating the social interrogation of autonomous vehicles into society by building a holistic view of the socio-political discourses among policymakers, industry stakeholders, technicians, and members of the public. So rather than predicting the future, I studied different social groups, uh, perception, imagination, and expectation to open up possibilities, trigger new perspectives, and pose fundamental questions that can enrage an understanding of this ongoing process. Next slide, please. So why am I a social anthropologist looking at autonomous vehicles? A technological invention is not equal to a social innovation. Throughout history, we have uh, many failed cases of transport technologies. I briefly name two. So the first case is Aramis. It was an ambitious uh, personal rapid transit system that can integrate the efficiency of railways and the flexibility of automobiles in the 1970s. The death of this a highly anticipated project occurred after two decades efforts. The other example is the EV1 project. EV1 is an electric car manufactured by GM uh, in the 1960s. The car was fast, quiet, and beneficial to the environment. However, rather than achieving business success, GM ended up crashing most of the vehicles with only a few EV EV1s delivered to museums and research institutes. So the, the failures of those two projects uh, are not just centered around technology. Aramis failed because the feasibility of that vehicle is not uh, certain. 
the costs are variable, the operating conditions are chancy, and the political support is inconsistent. An EV1 project failed because of the short-sightedness of the, the local authorities, the lack of demands in the market, and the division of people's attitudes. Also, there's a documentary called uh, Who Killed Electric Car in 2006. That documentary implies uh, the pressure coming from the oil industry. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, anthropologist Latour, Latour is a philosopher and also a, a social anthropologist who looks at technologies, especially uh, transport technologies. So he said, the more a technological project progresses, the more the role, role of technology decreases. Even when a technological invention is feasible, it doesn't mean we can just throw it there and say, oh great, it's going to work in society and benefit our everyday life. There's a whole lot more complexity behind being in the socio-political environment where that technology operates. So I believe the key to the success of autonomous vehicles social integration is not only about, about technology itself, but the interdependency of the technological feasibility, the economic viability, political support, ideological opportunism, multi-collaboration, the everyday complexity, and of course, the uncertainty behind the technological invention. Uh, in line with today's topic, I focus a bit more on the aspects of safety and trust. Next slide, please. So what is safe? This concept has broad meanings. It refers to more than having a robust vehicle that can travel you between A and B without collision. Uh, it's also about social and cultural safety. We have just heard insights from Peter into the technical aspects. Uh, some social researchers have also asked questions like, how safe is safe? How can we prove it to the public? And who decides the standards of safe? Uh, apart from this, what I would like to highlight is the social safety in the traveling environment. When we interact with an AV or using or being in one, do we feel safe? Issues such as sexual harassment and gender and racial discrimination have being acknowledged in a shared autonomous taxi or on an autonomous bus, especially on an autonomous bus, where a driver, the human authoritative figure, is eventually removed, who regulates a passenger's travel behavior, and who offers support when somebody has an emergency, say heart attack, and what kind of alternatives can we have that's equivalent to human responses so that people feel safe? How can an autonomous vehicle address the long existing issues in our transport system? While at the same time, we have new emerging issues like data invasion that causes a lot of fear. Uh, so data invasion is also associated with safety and trust and liability. Autonomous vehicles will be eventually connected, whether that's V2V, vehicle to vehicle, or V2I, vehicle to infrastructure, or V2X, vehicle to everything, we will have convenience. But the public also has concern about cybersecurity and questions such as whose data. Uh, no technology can be perfect. Even at this moment, my reception may collapse and Zoom may just kick me out. Autumn's vehicle crashes happened before and it might happen again. When it happens, who can access the data from the black box and control the investigation process? And what kind of data will be collected in the first place? If autonomous vehicles operating environment is not safe and transparent, how can people place trust in the autonomous vehicle services? And trust itself is a complex uh, philosophical concept. So let's say I'm a terrible driver, but I do have a driver's license and I'm positive about technology. Uh, in fact, I have joined two autonomous vehicle trials and I'm comfortable to use it again and use that service in the future, knowing that I can back up. But do I trust the, the same vehicle? Do I feel comfortable 
to let my grandma, who doesn't know how to drive, being alone in that vehicle. I certainly will have more concern. And some of my participants who also express their willingness to, to uh, try autonomous vehicles. When I ask, uh, when, when ask them to, to have their teenage children or small babies in the vehicle, so the level of trust drops. That says different social groups have different needs and wants and the context matters. When it comes to aut autonomous vehicles, safe and trust mean very different things to an engineer and to a single mother who has two children or to a disabled person who lives in the rural area. And that's why we need more in-depth social research. Uh, that's a key message I'm sending here. Uh, we don't have many answers to the ongoing or the future, but we inspire people to see the big picture and uh, think about things they didn't think before. The questions uh, we pose and the possibilities we review uh, can also bridge different parties to work together. Uh, next slide, please. So the final bit is call for in-depth social research uh, in this area. So my colleagues and I did a bibli bibliometric review of autonomous vehicle research. Our publication is in press. We identified over 18,000 key articles about autonomous vehicles published between 1970 and 2019. The positive side is that uh, in the past three years, we see a fast accumulation of knowledge in this domain. We used, uh, we used topic modeling and divided those articles into certain clusters with each focusing on one topic. Among those certain clusters, only one cluster, uh, that's cluster number 10, investigates the social impacts of autonomous vehicles. The rest focus on machine learning, algorithm, modeling, and some spe uh, specific techniques for autonomous vehicle detection and navigation. So in total, less than 9% of the research looks at the non-tech aspects of autonomous vehicles. And even within the very limited social research, uh, researchers tend to focus on uh, public acceptance and a way to improve it. When we talk about users, customers, and consumers, I also hope more researchers will ask, uh, what about non-users who might be left out in this transition? Because eventually uh, the AV's large scale operation will affect everyone and likewise its rollout will be affected by different social groups. So I'm going to stop here and I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sinyi. Uh, so that, that, that's very interesting and it, it really is uh, particularly interesting um, from, from the engineering perspective. Yeah, I, from my personal perspective, being very involved in the engineering side, um, but we do need to appreciate that this is providing solutions for society and we really do need to capture those um, so, so social aspects um, to make sure we've got the right solution. Um, so yes, so um, opening it up um, for questions and answers uh, now uh, with uh, Zinyi and Peter. So um, I mean, just to uh, remind people, please do um, ask your questions using the Q&A function um, so we want your questions just to kick things off. Um, so something that's often debated um, in terms of um, CAV assurance and trust is uh, the usage of data. So um, the collection and, and sharing of data um, in order to monitor and, and get data sets for, for um, ensuring things are safe. Um, so to Peter, I mean, what types of data or data sets um, are useful um, for kind of uh, verifying and validating safety, um, helping um, back up that things are robust in, in, in the discipline areas that you're working in? Okay, so the, it really depends. Uh, what I'm uh, currently doing with uh, colleagues from uh, Intel Labs, uh, uh, they have uh, a specific architecture, which is uh, somewhat related to the architecture used by Mobileye, but uh, it is slightly different nevertheless. Uh, it has a primary 
uh, control of the AV and it has a checker which uh, is uh, meant to check uh, uh, whether the operation of the primary is okay and there is a third independent system which is if there is a disagreement between the two the uh, vehicle is uh, supposed to to be uh, stopped this is the uh, safety. So the interesting uh, question, uh, if you look at the models, is okay, you have uh, roughly three different uh, boxes. If we ignore the details, each of them is a very complex uh, system. The first two channels uh, have machine learning and so on. But if we, ignore, if we ignore the details, we're talking about three different uh, uh, channels. And uh, first, obviously, very interesting question because it affects in the end how safe the uh, whole system uh, is, is about the failure correlation between the uh, first two channels. Uh, uh, and we know from the past uh, other systems which are e uh, even developed uh, independently, they tend to fail uh, simultaneously on uh, in situations which are genuinely difficult. They are difficult from the primary, they may be difficult for the secondary. Therefore, the failures are not just independent. You cannot just uh, assume uh, uh, independence. So getting data in order to be able to quantify the degree of correlation between the failures of the two channels is essential because in then, it uh, will affect uh, very significantly the conclusion about the whole thing um, uh, as a whole. So this is what we have discussed. They, they understood what uh, the, the problem is, and now we are looking at uh, ways after, uh, either to uh, get uh, uh, suitable data from existing records. Uh, indeed, there have been millions and millions of uh, miles and near misses, uh, uh, real failures, so it may be possible to extract some uh, uh, data which will uh, shed some light on this uh, failure correlation, or even to, to see whether we can use uh, uh, simulation, dedicated uh, simulation study. Uh, Intel have developed uh, something called uh, Clara, if I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, which uh, creates a simulation environment uh, for driving the cars, and we can create different situations and see how the, uh, these blocks of uh, the architecture uh, will tend to fail uh, when they uh, are presented with a difficult uh, situation. So this is number one uh, that uh, I am looking at to, to, to be able to quantify the degree of correlation between. And by the way, this is a very, uh, very common architecture. to have a primary, to have a, a secondary. That therefore, there are variations in details. But um, this is a problem which uh, really needs to be scrutinized. So hopefully there will be other opportunities and I may be able to share what we, uh, what we are going to, uh, to do about this particular problem. Thank you. So yeah, so in particular sharing of data for um, validation of machine learning. So um, Zinyi, uh, kind of pivoting, to, pivoting that question to, to follow up for you. So I mean, do you have any thoughts um, on usage of data? I mean, for example, um, uh, sensitivities and acceptance by society for usage of data? Do they accept um, their own personal data kind of being shared and used if um, it is uh, helping uh, achieve wide, wider societal safety? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that's a great question. I think at the moment we will have more and we need to have more communication and negotiation and what kind of data will be collected perhaps will uh, largely depends on the technology itself. So what kind of soft software uh, does that technology firm use? Uh, and they decide what kind of commercial data they will collect. So because that is highly commercial, they may not, uh, they are not willing to share the data. But if we need to have certain investigation and to make the system transparent, so it's going to be a collaboration between technology firms car manufacturers, and also uh, with, with the police, sta police stations, for example. So, yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, because of the technology is not uh, mature, we may not know what exactly data we need to collect for different, uh, for different technology firms. So that's kind of what I'm attempting to represent with that, that kind of circle I had of, of you have the needs and then what the solution is and 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 uh, 
that's the way I see it. But yeah, yeah. So, so thanks for that. Um, so um, one question that has come in uh, for you, Sinyi, is um, so in your research, um, how broad was the demographic um, that was surveyed? Um, is, is there any as uh, kind of other area um, gaps um, that need to be covered? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, my method uh, includes participant observation, interviews, uh, workshops. I did uh, have survey, but that's only a small scale. Uh, the reason I prefer to have qualitative research over quantitative research, uh, but still have a combination is that quantitative research can give you, a, a, you know, like quick answers, a large scale what people want, but then you don't really know the deep meaning behind. So that's why we go, we anthropologists go out and talk to people for, uh, you know, like, like have the long in-depth sessions and try to uh, in trigger the storytelling and know their uh, everyday commuting experience and then identify the pain points they are suffering from or what they want to have in the future. So I think we need, uh, so for me, it's like I use different uh, methods to collect data. And that's why I try to bridge perspectives from different parties, uh, policymakers, technicians, and industry stakeholders, um, different social groups among the public. Thank you. Um, and a, uh, so another question that's come in um, for Peter is, so um, probabilistic modeling has been shown uh, so th this question is coming from Andrew Payne. So thanks for the question, Andrew. Uh, probabilistic modeling has been shown in other sectors such as uh, rail um, or various others um, to be able to significantly be able to reduce risk and infrastructure work required. Um, the challenge remains. Um, so modeling based on human assumptions and knowledge. So how confident can we be about addressing this potential risk? Um. OK, um, this is a great question, really. Uh, and I suspect Andrew has uh, serious doubts, uh, doubts uh, whether probabilistic uh, modeling is uh, the way to go to deal with uh, human behavior. There have been uh, so many uh, studies which uh, demonstrate the value of uh, using a probabilistic uh, statement. But I would like to go back to my original uh, uh, presentation when I said uh, when we use probabilistic models and would like to use somehow the results from this uh, modeling for assurance, an essential part of uh, this whole exercise is uh, to be confident that the model is uh, credible. How you do it, of course, it depends on the, uh, on the uh, particular uh, case. Uh, uh, I don't think that there is a recipe how we uh, provide the justification why a probabilistic uh, a model is uh, useful. But uh, for instance, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, an example of uh, when people try to, to model uh, probabilistically. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, colleagues uh, of mine at the uh, city applied probabilistic models to demonstrate the benefits from uh, uh, of this uh, in mammography of having more than one uh, a radiologist or to combine the radiologist and uh, uh, these uh, uh, systems used in uh, mammography. So they uh, successfully uh, managed to get the, all the probabilistic parameters which are necessary uh, looking at uh, uh, available data about the performance of uh, radiologists uh, uh, looking at uh, mammograms and uh, passing a judgment whether there is a calcification and so on. So the, the short answer is uh, if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, but yes, I, I uh, accept that uh, if data is not uh, available and uh, one needs to set up uh, uh, specific uh, studies in order to collect this uh, data, then this make, uh, makes the, the, the is using probabilistic models uh, uh, a bit uh, difficult. Um, and I would like to conclude uh, with uh, what is the alternative? If we don't engage uh, with probabilistic models and say, oh, it's too difficult, we don't really know the parameters, what is the alternative? 
uh, you are uh, relying on something without uh, really spelling out uh, what you assume. Uh, and I don't think that this is uh, any, any better. Trying, uh, possibly getting it wrong, uh, is, uh, in my opinion, at least uh, better than uh, uh, not trying uh, at all. And finally, the, the range, uh, if the question is, uh, if I don't know exactly the uh, probabilistic parameter characterizing the behavior of the humans, uh, uh, I, I, how can I uh, use the outcomes? You can do sensitivity analysis and to see that maybe for a very uh, broad range of values, the the human impact on uh, on the particular uh, cyber physical systems are not going to be that great. If you see that they are essential, then you need to scrutinize and uh, uh, engage in empirical study to find these uh, more or less accurate uh, values. So I'm not sure whether I satisfied Andre's uh, questions, but I tried. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm I'm driven by my own curiosity to um, follow that up by asking does. Uh, machine learning uh, put a different, uh, add a different, uh, add an extra dimension onto it. So, I mean, if the probabilistic system is as kind of a a straightforward signal to noise um, issue, um, is is that more kind of is the probabilistic nature more predictable than if it's a machine learned system um, and it might have, you know, the, the probabilistic uh, may, the uncertainty involves kind of some very odd unforeseen behavior rather than predictable behavior. Does that change the, the, the face of how the modeling is approached? I think the, the uh, again, Andrew's, uh, Andrew, Andrew's question about the, uh, dealing with risk. This is where the probabilistic models really are useful. Machine learning has its, uh, and depending on what type of uh, machine learning is uh, being used, uh, it has its own uh, uh, problem recently uh, with a PhD student of mine, we look at uh, the impact of training and retraining on the accuracy of uh, uh, different uh, classifiers. And not surprisingly, because this is the nature of uh, uh, most uh, machine learning techniques, when you retrain, you may improve uh, the performance of uh, a classifier marginally, it becomes uh, more and more accurate uh, on average. But you, there are uh, elements inevitably, and you know, I say inevitably, which is uh, based on a very extensive uh, uh, empirical studies, inevitably you, uh, examples which were properly classified prior to your retraining uh, became incorrectly classified after the uh, in uh, retraining of uh, allegedly improved machine learning. And this is something which uh, in technical system, in software engineering is, not, uh, is known as uh, regression faults. Regression faults are typically seen in the process as uh, something which is uh, just an indication of a sloppy process. Uh, if you do software development properly and you fix bugs, you have to run uh, regression uh, testing in order to eliminate the regression faults. Here, this is the nature of the machine learning. You can't do anything. It, it just says, I improve it, but this is only at the expect, uh, expense of something else. And this is something quite uh, probably obvious, but nevertheless very different from everything that uh, at least I'm aware uh, um, um, existed in the safety critical system. And it has to be factored in uh, when we uh, make uh, create this assurance uh, case for the uh, any system uh, relying on uh, machine learning. So I think uh, this is where I'll, uh, I'll leave it probably. Uh, yes. Thank you. Th th thanks for that, because that's helping me with my curiosity. Um, so a question that's come in uh, for uh, Xinyi is, um, so uh, another question from Andrew Payne. Thanks for all the questions, Andrew. Um, so are we trying too hard to make um, autonomous vehicles work everywhere globally. Um, so if CAVs are primarily for highly developed countries, uh, what research should be done to help adoption? Um, and then I would also say for that, I mean, are there actually issues with regards to uh, where CAVs are going to be introduced? So um, the, the areas which are in most need of having enhancement of safety are perhaps the ones that are going to get um, have, have the least chance of AVs being adopted in, in, in the, for the foreseeable future. 
Right. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And in fact, that's a big question. I think one point uh, came from Peter is, is brilliant. Uh, just now, Peter, Peter talked about uh, autonomous vehicles, if that's trans in Siberia, but does it really work in California? So context really matters. Uh, it also applies to the social aspects. So uh, different regions, different countries have different cultures and people have different expectations and uh, the process, the level of trust might uh, you know, be different. So that's why we need to uh, have the cultural comparison and the in-depth research uh, throughout uh, the, according to the timeline and also in different areas. So that's a com complex process, I have to say. Thank you. So I'm just looking through the questions now. Um, uh, so another question for Xinyi. Um, so um, a few, uh, there's, a, it's from Anonymous. Uh, so there's a few mentions of invention failures uh, mentioned in the slides. Um, do you think AV development is learning from past failures? Or what do you think are the key things the industry should pay attention to? Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's a great question. And I think absolutely policymakers and uh, different parties are learning from the past. So say uh, right now our social research is still uh, dominated and driven by commercialization. But uh, like I started my field work last year in uh, mostly in London and Edinburgh. And whenever I go to big conferences in this field, I notice that public sectors and especially governments are pushing the collaboration and trying to uh, diverse the focuses to access accessibility, affordability, try to have the eco, uh, social equity uh, in this domain. So I think uh, that's a very positive trend. And also I think the context of this research will expand. So uh, when we talk about autonomous vehicles in the transport system, we can't use the linear thinking, but eventually uh, more researchers work on smart cities or even broader concepts may join. Uh, in this dialogue. So that perhaps may trigger the uh, ideas from philosophical, ethical, and legal perspectives. Thank you. Um, one other question that we have here, so from uh, Jonathan Ribby, um, is, um, is it reasonable to characterize machine learning as similar to people learning new skills? Um, such as improvements in identifying risk with experience, except that it is retained and improved over generations. Uh, and as such, it is explicable and will become acceptable to people and by extension, legislative and authorities bodies. So, I mean, I will answer this in part myself in saying that there's two aspects um, to machine learning. So one aspect of machine learning is that it's a system that has um, learned how to provide a solution um, through some kind of method. There's, there's various me methods of doing it, rather than it being something that's been deterministically coded by a programmer that they've put in an algorithm. Um, so one aspect of machine learning is, is that it's, it's a little bit of a black box. You, you can kind of see what the software is doing, but you don't, the, the creator, they've supervised in its learning process, but they don't actually fully understand it. No, deterministically exactly what's going on it. There's a second aspect of machine learning, which is um, you can have a, a machine learning system that has learned and is now static, or you can have a machine learning system which is continually learning as it's doing online learning. Um, so there's two different aspects of machine learning and um, how they're dealt with legislatively and, and that aspect of things um, is all, um, you know, is, is a very hot topic. Um, so 
partially answering the question. Um, but um, I, I guess, P Peter, initially, do you have um, anything else you, you want to add on, on that kind of topic? I think you captured what I would have uh, uh, said in response to this uh, question. The data becomes part of the algorithm. And it is, uh, and for this reason, it is very difficult to uh, verify uh, machine learning because uh, you only see the outliers, the wrong decisions uh, as a consequence of uh, uh, using uh, uh, some data. And if this data never comes in the labs, then you can verify the uh, machine learning just to discover it later, uh, probably a bit too late. But yes, this is it. Uh, this is what uh, makes it uh, different. The algorithm is uh, kind of deterministic, but the data uh, in the end uh, uh, affects the, the how the solution handles the if it is a classifier, how it does the classification, if it is used for something else. So, and we don't really have uh, control over this. It's a uh, uh, impossible uh, state space to, to deal with and verification is a problem. The question of course is more, uh, is broader, whether uh, how the machine learning will eventually become similar to how people, humans uh, learn. One hopes that uh, sooner or later this will uh, uh, be the case, but then when? And until then, we, we need to find uh, uh, some ways to, to deal with this uh, open problem. Thank you very much. And I mean, Xi, do you have any follow up on that? Um, I mean, it's uh, the, the topic of kind of AI in general is something that's very emotive in general to, to, to people. Right. Uh, well, uh, my view would be. Uh, we need to have more public engagement and education and to find a way to bridge the language. See, right now it's like uh, when it's very deep about machine learning or AI, then probably AI may hardly have an understanding of what's going on. So it's about find a way to engage the public and tell them uh, what's happening in a very basic way. And so uh, another point is, I think at this moment for autonomous vehicle de design and development, it's crucial to have more trials, not just for the safety taste, uh, testing, but also to have trials uh, open to the public. Um, those uh, public demonstrations may uh, improve trust and safety, uh, social safety, and also uh, just uh, let the public know what's happening so that we can have the brainstorming in a broad context. Thank you very much for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we definitely uh, need uh, more research. Um, so we've got one minute left. Uh, so, um, so I guess just to wrap up, um, just, just 30 seconds um, to each of you. Um, what, what do you see as the, this, the key challenges in achieving societal trust in AVs? What, what's like on your top, top of your list? Ladies first. Okay, I, I'll go. I think it's to understand uh, people's uh, imagination and perception. And uh, the challenge is sometimes people don't really know what they want until they try or and until they find out what they don't want. And then back to that point again. Uh, so that's why we need to have public engagement and demonstration. And of course, more in-depth social research to engage them. Thank you, and, uh, and Peter? Um, it's a very exciting uh, time. Uh, and this whole movement uh, of autonomous uh, vehicle, this is, I, I don't recall anything like this in my lifetime. So this is very, very exciting. I'm not a strong believer that uh, in this uh, democracy in trust, because uh, trust now may very soon uh, become mistrust uh, uh, tomorrow. I would rather prefer uh, the problem of uh, trust in AV to be uh, solved by, by science, by knowledge, by if necessary by uh, regulation because uh, the threats otherwise are so great that uh, it will be very very disappointing for this exciting new movement to end in a in a mistrust in autonomous uh, vehicle uh, so I, I, I 
okay. I hope it sounds a positive uh, view for, for the future, but I, I have my, uh, my reservations about how this can be done. Thank, thanks for that, Peter. So, um, so that rounds off our Q&A session. So thank you very much for all the questions and, and thank you very much uh, for all your input and answers. Um, so um, just quickly to say um, our upcoming webinars, so uh, which is on the screen at the moment. So on the 17th of June is uh, the Virtual Connections Cafe um, support and networking webinar. Um, on the 18th of June, uh, third Thursday event, on seizing Singapore's opportunities. Um, I've actually spent the last four years working in Singapore, um, so I know firsthand there are a lot of opportunities, um, lots of great work going on in Singapore. And on the 24th of June um, is uh, the Urban Links Africa open call launch and briefing. Um, so uh, just to say, uh, everybody who's registered with their email, they will uh, get a link uh, to uh, this recording. Um, and um, if uh, I, I believe the um, Xinyi and Peter's uh, details have been shared in the slides. So if people do want to follow up, um, that they're the contact details there. Um, so just to, to finish off, thank you very much. Um, to uh, Dr. Peter Popov and uh, Chin Yi Wu uh, for um, participating in this event and sharing your knowledge. It's been very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, and thank you everybody for uh, attending this event and for participating. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much.